Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, activists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. Lorraine Lotsuf Abramson is a child of South Africa and was the only Jewish girl in her all white grammar school. And what a dichotomy she faced belonging to a family that had immigrated to South Africa to escape racial and religious persecution, only to wind up on the side of the oppressors. Lorraine has written about those experiences, her career as an award-winning track star, and the romance that led her to move to the United States. Her book, My Race, A Jewish Girl Growing Up Under Apartheid in South Africa, has just been published by DBM LC Press. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Lorraine, your mother grew up in Johannesburg and your father arrived there in, arrived in South Africa in 1921, part of a Jewish immigration, mostly from Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. Latvia and Lithuania. Your father raised cattle on a farm in the Orange Free State mm -hmm. and you grew up in a tiny town of Rates. Yes. Um, what was it like growing up Jewish in a tiny South African town? Well, you know, as a young child, it was really an I idyllic uh, lifestyle. We, um, there were almost no cars in the streets, so we ran around barefoot. Not that we couldn't afford shoes, but that's just what we did. You know, everybody just played out in the streets, and um, it was a very casual uh, lifestyle. I, I remember it with fond memories. And very little anti-Semitism. Well, and you know, this <coughs> is the thing. We you know, when you started with the introduction and you said we were on the side of the oppressors, we were on the side of the oppressors by virtue of our white skin. Right. Not because we necessarily subscribe to the apartheid philosophy. I just wanted to clarify that. But um, because the apartheid government had another big issue on their hands, the because we were white and I was an athlete, it was, you know, I somehow was accepted because of that so but you did obviously I mean I would think observe the racism against black Africans yes um, you know I was reading about you were writing about when you were in the fourth grade and your teacher walking around with the Bible and you know thanking God that I guess the, the students would pray thanking God that they'd been born white yes yes that was something that we were taught in school um, the apartheid the racism was um, ingrained from a very young child, you know, and um, all my, f like in school, the teachers used to uh, tell us that this was God's will, that uh, the apartheid is God's will. And I know that my friends must have, they went home to parents who, you know, endorsed m my teacher's philosophies. But fortunately for me, I went home to parents who felt differently. So I had that balance in my life. And there were other ways that um, the racial discrimination was manifested. The mm -hmm. African workers had to look down when they were speaking to a white person, sort yes. of like in the South, right. where I grew up. Um, every house in rates had bars on it. Yes. Because why was that? Well, I guess it was, um, it was the, the feeling was to, for safety which I always, as I write in the book, was, in, was like a, a, a slur against, you know, that, that it's not safe not to have protection against the overwhelmingly large African population. And, you know, when I lived in South Africa, there were about, I'm talking about the 50s and the 60s, there were about 3 million whites and over 20 million Africans. So the apartheid government felt that the only way that they can maintain rule over such an overwhelmingly large majority is with an iron fist. And they did. We lived in a police state, which meant that the police had complete control over, complete authority to do whatever they needed to do to maintain their control. And I want to just add, in 1950, the government instituted an act known as the Suppression of Communism Act. And the wording on this document was so broad that a communist was anyone who spoke out openly against the apartheid government. They were considered um, a traitor to the country and a threat to the regime. 
and they'd be jailed or put under house arrest indefinitely with no trial. So I learned from a very young age to be careful about what I said to whom outside of the four walls of my home. Did you know any whites who were actually arrested or jailed for what they said? For the political activity? There were definitely <coughs> people who did speak out and who definitely did go to jail or had to leave the country very quickly. Um, there was one member in our family who had to leave and go to London and lived her life out there. Um, I don't know too many others, but um, you, we had three choices in South Africa. We could either um, speak out against the government and go to jail or leave the country, or live our lives. And a lot of people just, you know, lived their lives. Um, your family had black servants because yes. I guess they were paid so little that most whites could afford to have, you know, black servants. Right. Gracie in your house was the daughter of Thomas, the, the, the main farm Yes, hand. yes, like the manager on my father's what farm. Was your, what was your relationship with Gracie like? Well, Gracie was um, almost like my second mother. The nannies and, and the, the help in the South African homes lived with the families, not in the home. They had a special structure that they, where they had a bedroom and bathroom and so on. But because legally they were not allowed to sleep in the house. Not allowed. Okay. Not allowed. And, um, but Gracie lived with us for such a long time that she actually started keeping kosher. She wouldn't... Um, mixed dairy and, and meat together, so she took on a lot of our customs. But I loved Gracie, and I talk about this in my book, that now when I look back, I remember how she used to bake us birthday cakes on, on my birthday and so on, but I never knew when her birthday was. I didn't know what her last name was, as I think about it now as an adult. There were so many things about her that I didn't know, even though I loved her so much. I wish I could have asked her now about how she felt about living in, in apartheid South Africa. Do you have any idea what happened to her or where she? She, eventually she developed heart condition, a heart condition and she had to go back to the farm. She couldn't do the physical work in the home, home anymore. But I, I think of her with great remorse because if I had spoken to her, I would have validated her as a human being by asking her questions. How much older was she than you? Oh, well, I was like um, a young child. I was in elementary school, and she was like my mom's age. So okay. she was, you know, a mother figure, so Okay. To speak. Yeah. One of the most um, <clears throat> dramatic, compelling stories that you tell in, in, in your book was the incident with Pete, the gardener, mm -hmm. uh, I, who I assume was a grown man at the time. He was. He you was. were 11. Yes. You were calling him one day. He ignored you, and your father went up to him and punched him, punched him in the face, I guess, several times, and right. said, don't ever ignore my daughter again. Right. What was that about? You know, I needed to put that in the book because first of all, I had a very close and wonderful relationship with my father. He was not a violent man. And the fact that he reacted that way in that incident had such a searing effect on my mind, you know, that, um, I still remember it was so out of character. But I think that the reason that happened was because of our close relationship. I mean, anyone that disrespected his daughter triggered that reaction in him. It was never spoken about again. It was never discussed. And I think that he felt very humiliated to have reacted that way in front of me. But as I say, it was... If you've yeah. been living in Queens, and this had been the Black Garden in Queens, um, mm -hmm. and he had ignored you, do you think he would have reacted that way? Would my father have? Mm -hmm. You know, this is a different world and a different environment. And when my parents came to this country, I was very proud of them at the adjustment that they made to, to the United States. It was a whole different set of rules. We didn't have to... We were all... You judged someone by the content of the character rather than which racial group they fitted into. And it would have been a very different scenario. I'm sure that would not have happened. It, so. it, 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 it sounded to me like your father's way of enforcing the rules, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, you know we, we've got to enforce these rules if we're going to live here. And one of the things you do is that you've got to 
you have to show a certain deference to white people, even if it's an 11 year old. Yes, <clears throat> yes, that, that is true. We were all a product of our environment. We were taught to never, ever question authority. I know that I never, I would never question my parents. I would never question when I went to a strict all girls boarding school. I lived within a strict No framework. rebellious phase? Never. It wow. never occurred to me because I knew that there was a stiff price to pay and all this was w within the context of a police state. So, um... Now you know. your father, you, you, you write that your, your mother was openly critical of the apartheid they state. Your mm -hmm. father was more uh, supportive of it. His view was that, you know, there's 20 million of them, there's 3 million of us, and unless we keep that under control, they're gonna right. take us out. Um, how did this strike you? I took a little bit of each. You know, with my, fa with my mom, she had one foot out the door of South Africa as long as I can remember. She always said, how long do they think they can get away with it? She always used to quote, um, you know, the, the Jews in Germany thought it could never happen to them. And, and she, she just never had faith in, in the long survival of that country mm -hmm. under the apartheid regime. My father, on the other hand, it's not that he supported it because he never voted for that government, but he felt that this, his safety, it, it was a safety issue more, you know, in terms of this is where he lives, this is where he makes a living, this is his home. And under these circumstances, we're so in the minority that that's, you know, that's the way. So I kind of fell under both of them. It was, mm -hmm. It's difficult to explain, but, you know, you take a bit of... Did you, did, I mean, did, you, did one ever hear, I mean, one could take that position that, you know, it's us against them and if, mm -hmm. and, but I mean, did you hear people take the position that, okay, well, maybe we'll just sort of all share equally in the fruits of the country and that it won't be an us, us against them? That happened when Nelson Mandela came into, to power because, um, you know, I had the opportunity, I just want to say this, I had the opportunity to go back to South Africa after the new, uh, after Mandela had taken over. I was now living here, but I went back, one of my uncles wasn't well, and I took my daughter and we went back. And I had an opportunity to go with one of my South African cousins to visit Soweto. And um, our driver was an African man, and he took us into Soweto, and that was, alone was an experience for me because we were never allowed into any black areas either. So um, we toured Soweto and I saw Nelson Mandela's home. And then we stopped and we had coffee in one of the um, cafes there. And it was the first opportunity that I ever had to speak, to ask very important questions, honest questions to a, a black South African gentleman. And what I asked him was, how come, how does he explain that there was a peaceful transfer of power wasn't there anger and vengefulness and this was their opportunity to, you know, to take control kind of thing? And what he said to me was very interesting. He said that all the, that Nelson Mandela was their God and their icon. They would do whatever he told them to do and they were ready. When he came into power, if he had said to all the black South Africans, you know what, guys, this is our turn. We can, now's our chance to, to get revenge. We should go out and kill all the whites. He said they were ready to do that. But instead, what he did say was, let's put the past behind us and let's all move forward together. And I remember his words were something to the effect of, let's all share in the bounty of this beautiful land. And that's what they did. He's a, he was so, really a, a remarkable so leader in that respect. He was, and he <coughs> definitely avoided a major bloodbath. And while I give him all the credit, some credit, I also have to give credit to the, the white prime minister of the time, de Klerk, who saw the writing on the wall and, and took this big step. So. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back with more with Lorraine Lotsoff Abramson after these messages. Thank you. Today is Saturday. 60 minutes of physical activity a day and eating well can help get your child healthy. Get ideas. Get involved. Get going at letsmove.gov. That's letsmove.gov.
welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Lorraine Lotsef Abramson, author of My Race, A Jewish Girl Growing Up Under Apartheid in South Africa, which was published by DBM Press. When you were 12, your parents sent you off to boarding school, but mm -hmm. three hours away, to the Unisi School in yes. Bloemfontein. Yes. Very what was good. it like at the boarding school? It was a very uh, strict environment. We wore uniforms every day. We uh, were, our uniforms were inspected to make sure our tunics were not too short. As soon as our hair touched our collars, we had to tie it back. Very strict framework. It was an academically wonderful school and that's really the reason we went there. But in that environment, I was just so used to living uh, under a lot of rules that um, for some reason it was, we did as we were told. My escape at boarding school was my track running. When I was able to leave the school every day and go out for workouts at the track next door, um, it was an escape for me and the only time where I felt that I was really in control of my own destiny and felt the freedom was during when I was running. And you had started running when you were a little girl. You, you ran your first, you won your first race at age five. Yes. yes. And it was, it was, a, was it just this right. feeling of freedom that you got when you ran? Well, I didn't realize at the time, but when we <clears throat> did have our, we, I, as I write in the book, we played Olympics and all the surrounding kids when I was five years old in the little town of Rates on the dirt roads with our bare feet where all the bare toes lined up along the line. There were boys ranging from 12 down to five boys and girls and when the starter said on your marks get set go and I shot out like a cannon and I beat everybody and then um, they accused me of cheating, that we had to rerun the race, because how could I possibly, a five-year-old girl, beat all the big boys? We reran the race, and I won again. And uh, I think I was more surprised than anybody else. And that was when I started running every year in the local track meets, and eventually at boarding school, I got my first coach and took it from there. And you got so. to, one thing you got to do, well, one thing, there were more Jewish girls. There was a bunch of Jewish yes, girls at the school, yes. so that mm -hmm. was different. That's true. Uh, and did you, did you go to a, a synagogue in the town, or did you? Yes. Okay. Yes, that was part of the reason my parents also wanted to send me. They wanted me to get the experience of um, going to synagogues on Saturdays and establishing an identity and also, you know, having Jewish friends as well, so... Um, now, when you were 15, you got to go to Israel yes. to compete. Is, is the Maccabee Games? Yes. Tell me, what, tell me about the Maccabee Games. The Maccabee Games um, is a, an international competition that um, is held every four years in Israel, the year after the Olympics. And it's mainly for Jewish athletes, an opportunity for Jewish athletes to gather together there in, in friendly competition. It was the first time that I had left South Africa and I was amazed to see Jewish people from all countries where I didn't even know Jews lived. I mean, and the Indian team, their uniform were turbans as they marched in, and it was just a wonderful experience for me meeting, you know, Jews from all over the world. Were those so. games started because to allow, were, were there Jews in various countries who were, might not get a chance to race in their own countries? Was it a response to that? That the games were started? In 1936, the first Maccabee Games was held in Israel, and there were people <coughs> from, um, during the Nazi, during the World War II, people came to Israel to compete, and one of them was my uncle from Poland, who was a runner, and came to Israel and stayed. So the games offered an opportunity for people to escape from oppression and come to Israel. And, has and of course, Hitler did not allow Jews to compete in the in the Olympics when they were held there. I guess, no, I'm sure not. I'm sure. Um, so in so, general, what did the experience of going away for, for, to boarding school do for you? It made me independent. It made me believe in myself. I couldn't go to my parents for every question. It definitely, and at the time I didn't realize this, it definitely prepared me for a future time when I would make a longer trip, namely leaving South Africa to come and live in the United States after I met my husband at the Maccabee Games. He was on the American swimming team, I was on the South African track team. 
that was four years later. Right. And I want to say you, you won a lot of medals at the Mac. Three meeting. gold medals and a wonderful husband. So <laughs> that, is, that is a very good... What was it like going to... It was in Tel Aviv. What was it like seeing Tel Aviv, seeing Israel? Well, for me, it was interesting having seen it four years before and to see the growth of the country and what that country has accomplished in terms of... The a desert garden blooming in the desert. A desert environment, turning it around like that was... Um, I, I think very commendable and, you know, I felt very proud. So. Um, tell me about the, your meeting Richard, what that was like. He was a swimmer, American swimmer. He was, we met the last four days of the games. I don't, and we, after four days we decided we wanted to get married. And you were after how old? 19 at okay. the time. Okay. 19. He wasn't allowed to be married at the time. He was attending the Air Force Academy in Colorado and, um, they weren't allowed to be married until they graduated. So we had a three-year long-distance relationship before there was texting or emails or, you know, uh, what do you call it, Skype. Right. So it took a, a letter 10 days to get from Johannesburg to Colorado Springs and back. And then three years later, he did come down to Johannesburg and we got married and then came back to start our lives here. Um, so. In... Boston, where he was stationed yes. at the Air Force Base. Right, right. Um, in the 60s, and, and what year did you come to the United States? 68. Okay. 68. In the 60s, South Africa started being pressured by the international community yes. to change its racial policies. Mm -hmm. was banned from the Olympic Games in Tokyo in 1964. How did you feel about that? That was devastating. And I remember very clearly the, um, the, when the... Um, my track coach came to our workout and he had the newspaper under his arm and he showed us the headlines that said South Africa has been banned from the Olympics. At that time I was 18 and I remember feeling it's not fair. We worked so hard, you know, you train years and years for your one dream to be in the Olympics and then it gets taken away from you like that. And I, I remember saying that but I'm not a politician, the politicians don't care and I didn't ask to be born in South Africa, I happen to be living here. And then one of my teammates said to me, you know, Lorraine, we are part of the fabric of the society. We do live in South Africa. We enjoy its bounty. We are part of the fabric of this country. And of course, deep down, I knew that he was right. It's just that my head was just so filled with a disappointment at the time. But as I look back now as an adult, when I think about that time, I realize that, um, you know, a, the Olympic Games was a moment in my life, a big moment, but a moment. Whereas apartheid was something that people had to endure every day of their lives. So, you know, you just look at things differently as time goes on and when you're in a different setting. What was it like being in the United States, you know, following the civil right, the revolution mm -hmm. back at home? The Soweto riots, Mandela released, the, the violence, the the calls for divestment from South Africa, the uh, yeah. all kinds of announcements. You know, I get they got kicked out of the the soccer team was not allowed to right. compete. Right. Um, uh, Mandela being released from pri prison, and you know, mm -hmm. the free voting. What was it like following that from here? Following that from here, well, I can tell you first of all, I felt very privileged to have been able to bring up my children in this country because I was able to give them a different set of um, values. You know, I remember my, my daughter saying to me, um, going into, when she was four years old, we went into a supermarket and she said to me, um, Mommy, how come that little girl has a brown face and brown hands? And I said to her, well, how come you have a pink face and pink hands and I have brown eyes and you have blue eyes? I said, you know, everybody's different, but everybody's special. So I felt privilege to be able to give my child that message as opposed to what I needed to hear mm -hmm. when I grew up. So I was looking at it from an outsider point of view, feeling fortunate that I'm right, right. not in that environment. We only have about so. a couple minutes left, but yes. what made you write the book and what did you get out of writing the book? The idea of writing a book came to me after my twin granddaughters were born. It was when I became a grandmother that I started to think more about my own grandparents who left Eastern Europe, Lithuania and Latvia, and went to South Africa. And being that their world was so different from mine, I wish I had asked them more questions. 
but by the time I thought about it, it was too late. So I decided that since I grew up in a police state in, in apartheid South Africa, I really wanted to tell my story to my children so that they don't have the same regrets. And mm -hmm. as I started writing it, my friends said to me, Lorraine, this is a bigger story than just for your family. You should get a publisher and publish it. And I've been very gratified at the response because South Africans have found it nostalgic and Americans have learned about a culture they didn't know about at all. So. And your grandchildren are going to get to My grandchildren read about have it. given, they have already read about it. They've invited me to speak at their school, and I've done many, many book talks, and it's been a wonderful book journey. Well, it's, so. very, it, it's, it's very interesting, and, and um, a part of the book we won't get to discuss is about your, when you take your father and your husband mm -hmm. and children back to, back um, to his. He's Back to uh, Latvia, that, where he yes. where he came from. So they have to right. read a, they have to read the book. That's right. To find That's out right. about that. So. We're out of time, but I want to thank Lorraine Latsov Abramson for joining me today. My race, a Jewish girl growing up under apartheid in South Africa, has been published by DBM Press LC, for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. <laughs>